How you guys doing? <laughs> Great. It's good to be with you guys here. Um, all right. Here's, uh, here's what we're going to do. My goals are, are pretty modest. We're going to explore the history of the formation of the entire Bible <laughs> in, in like 70 minutes or something. Um, I am going to talk a lot for the next hour, and um, there's going to be a lot of f facts. Fire hose, you're going to drink from, I'm going to make you drink from a factual fire hose for, for the next hour or so. And so, you know, whatever, obsessive note takers, your hands are going to cramp by the end, and that's fine. I'm totally fine with that. This is being recorded, you know, so you can go back and it'll be available somewhere through reality's world of online goodness. So, um, uh, so let me at least give the framework here, because this isn't just about we learned a bunch of facts uh, tonight. Um, my, my goal is not to um, somehow try and prove that the Bible is divine or something like that. Um, I'm not trying to make a case, you know, that, uh, that you should necessarily read the Bible as God's Word or something. I happen to have that conviction, and uh, I think that there's, that's a reasonable conviction to have about the Bible. Um, if you're here and um, a friend invited you and you wouldn't self-identify as a Christian, first of all, you're my hero because um, walking into a room full of mostly Christians in a church on a, of your own choosing on a weeknight, like that's really admirable and <laughs> you're incredible for doing that and that's awesome. Um, but so if that's you, you know, I really, I, the first cop conversation topic I would uh, want to have with you is not to really to convince you anything about the Bible. I just really want you to consider Jesus, like Jesus of Nazareth and how amazing and remarkable he is. Then we'll talk about the Bible later. What's uh, you're processing who Jesus is and what he said and what he did. Um, so mainly I'm thinking about people who are followers of Jesus. And um, I, sa I said this uh, yesterday in the Sunday gatherings, but Followers of Jesus who have the same relationship to the Bible that you have with your strange uncle, right? Um, namely, that you were with him over the holidays, likely, and he's odd, and he's in your family, so you're supposed to like him, <laughs> right? But he really behaves weird, and he does weird things, but he gives you gifts sometimes, and he's kind of nice, so you like him sometimes, but, you know, most of the time. And I, I really think that how, if most Christians are honest... That's how they feel about the Bible, at least some of the time, anyone in the room here. It's like you're supposed to like it, and sometimes it really is beautiful in what it says, and, but then like you actually read most of it, and it's disturbing, and the violence, and the sex scandals, you know, and all this kind of thing. And so what, what is this? And, and the reason why that disturbs us is I think the main story, and this is really what I, my hope would just be that you walk away from this evening considering what links all the facts that we're going to consider a, a narrative about how the Bible came into existence. And it's the narrative that I think is based on a reasonable, honest reading of all of the historical evidence outside and inside of the Bible about how it came into existence. Because there's lots of narratives out there about how the Bible came into existence. Um, if you've ever watched anything on the History Channel about the Bible, you need to never do that again. Because right? <laughs> it's just, you know, I don't know what to say. They get the most fringe, on the margin voice who happens to have gotten a PhD or whatever. They don't represent the majority views of biblical scholarship, and they're the people who are telling the stories about the making of the Bible on the History Channel, which makes you wonder about everything that's on the History Channel, you know? But anyway, I don't know, at least for the Bible, it's just not a reliable source of information. Um, you know, the Da Vinci Code book and movies and everything that came out of that made it splash, you know, over, over a decade ago now. But that narrative still remains strong, strong in American culture. And that's that the Bible, you know, is the, pr is the production of a select few, you know, powerful political theologians who got together and said, not this book, yes, this one, not this one, yes, this one, because we want to dominate the world, you know, and pull the power play on the masses and so on. And of course, the only problem with that is that the Da Vinci Code 
said up front, though not as clearly as Dan Brown ought to have, that it is a novel, right? And that it's historical fiction, emphasis on the fiction of, of the historical fiction. Um, so, so that story's out there. And for people who grew up in a church setting full of self-righteous, legalistic people who were constantly appealing to the Bible, once you hear the Da Vinci Code story, you are liberated and free and quite happy to ignore the Bible for the rest of your life. Are you with me here? So, so that's a problem. And that's the, those are the dominant stories out there about the Bible. And so I just, I'm, I am doing what I can through whatever cartoons and uh, doing stuff like this to just really help people say like that's not that's actually the, those stories are the historical fiction right? uh, in honest reading of the making of the Bible that's con- the, the story is contained within the scriptures itself uh, but also evidence the public accessible history of the Bible throughout the historical record tells a different story and so that's the big picture that I hope you walk away with tonight. And that's what's going to link together all of the historical facts. How you guys doing? Okay, fire hose, fire hose on. <laughs> um, okay, so I, uh, if you were at uh, the Sunday gatherings uh, at Reality uh, Church San Francisco yesterday, I, I put this image up here by M.C. Escher. Um, and uh, I don't know if you're an Escher fan. I think he's brilliant. Um, but he, uh, this image, uh, for me, has become such a helpful helpful illustration of the historical, both Jewish and Christian confession about what the Bible is. Um, this, so this is a, it's called Drawing Hands, and it's exploring the, the, the paradoxical truth of complex entities, of things that are one yet two, of things that are distinct, two distinct things, yet they exist as one. So which hand is drawing the other? Yes, exactly. So, so to me, this is it's just perfect because the Jewish Christian confession throughout history has been about the Bible that it is a divine and a human word at the same time. Um, and again, if, if you were here at the Sunday gathering at Reality, you heard me, but repetition will help you right, with this one. So that it's a divine and a human word and that neither one cancels out the other or trumps the other. They both exist fully, simultaneously true at the same time. And the, the dominant narrative that I just laid out for you, one would be, you know, the common Christian narrative, which erases the human hand for the most part and treats the Bible as, uh, I call it, the golden tablets falling from heaven view. So the biblical authors, of course, you know, people wrote it, but for the most part, they're incidental, and, you know, God's presence or spirit zapped them in an ecstatic trance, and they're, you know, doing that whole thing as they write out the books. And so that's a very common, a common story. It's usually wrapped up with a view of what the Bible is for, namely that it's a divine rule book, um, that gives you the instructions for how to be the kind of person who makes it to the good place and not the bad place after you die. So that story of where the Bible came from and what it's for is very dominant in American Christian culture. Then you have the view that erases the divine hand and says it's merely a human book written by people. It's a very important cultural artifact. You know, this book's very influential. It shaped the course of many human civilizations, and so it's very important that you should know about it. And we might even say that it's a witness to how people in the ancient world experience the reality of God. Um, but, it's a, but it's merely a, a human word, and we shouldn't uh, take it that seriously. So the, and so that story is out there, too. And so... Uh, Again, my case is that I, I think it's reasonable. I'm not going to persuade anybody who isn't open-minded already on either side. But I think a reasonable reading of what the Bible is trying to tell us about its own origins tells a different, a different story. So here's, um, and again, if you, let's say this is the third time. I'm going to summarize really quickly what I said at the reality uh, gathering uh, yesterday on this, in the Sunday gathering. Um, and... Uh, the first mention of the writing of the Bible in the Bible. I know this is repetition, but this is only going to last five minutes. I went for like 45 minutes on this yesterday, so only five minutes here tonight. The first mention of the writing of the Bible, it's very interesting. Um, it doesn't occur in the first book of the Bible. There's actually nothing about the writing of the Bible 
in the first book of the Bible. Uh, it comes, rather, at a, at a point connected to the key figure, uh, Moses. And it's after the Israelites have been rescued out of slavery in Egypt, and they... Um, oh, th thank you. I just realized I'm supposed to forward the slides, but I think someone did it for me. So that, thank you, whoever did that. <laughs> it's the big green button. I should be able to push it. Um, so... Uh, after the Israelites escape out of slavery in Egypt, they're, they're wandering through the wilderness. And this uh, South Canaanite people group is ripe for plunder. They attack. And here's how, here's how the story goes. The Amalekites came and they attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, hey, get some of our men to go out and fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I'm going to stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. And if you're familiar with this odd story, I think, uh, Moses goes up, and as long as he holds his hands up, the Israelites are winning the battle, but he's old and his arms get tired. And so he has to get friends to hold his arms up so the Israelites don't lose. And they win the battle. And then after the battle's over, uh, the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered. It's the first mention of the writing of the Bible in the story of the Bible. And this is significant um, for a lot of reasons. First of all, um, Moses, it doesn't appear, is getting like zapped by a Holy Spirit lightning cloud or anything like that. It seems like he's in possession of all of his faculties, right? <laughs> right? That he is from his own memory and experience of this event to write down on the scroll this thing to be remembered. Are you with me here? This is very, like who's writing? Moses is writing. He's a human, right? Now, he's, he's doing it under divine direction, right? He hears and senses this is a story of a remarkable deliverance of God's people. We need to remember these stories of what God has done. And so that's the, that's the first purpose that we're told about why the Bible came into existence, to tell a story, right? Not a comprehensive history of every event that ever happened in Israel, but to a story of choosing the select events in the history of this people where God did remarkable things to save and redeem and rescue his people. That's the first mention of the writing of the Bible in the Bible. So whatever we think the Bible is for has to take this into account. First of all, it's a divine and human word, and it's one of its primary purposes is to tell a story. The second mention of the writing of the Bible in the Bible. These are great facts to know. As I said, use them at a party this Friday night. You'll win friends and influence people, I'm sure, right? So uh, it's uh, after uh, the Israelites come to the foot of Mount Sinai, and God uh, asks these people to enter into a covenant relationship with himself, with the God who just rescued them out of their slavery in Egypt. And so um, through Moses, he delivers the terms of this covenant relationship. We call them the Ten Commandments, but those are just the first ten. Um, right there in that story, between the story we just read and this story, a total of 42 get given to the Israelites. Uh, and it's all, it's mostly about like, what we would call social justice. It's shaping the, the life habits of these people towards greater justice, greater wisdom, greater generosity in their cultural context and setting. And so these laws come because God wants to make Israel a kingdom of priests, he says, a contrast community that'll go out and live in, among the nations as different kinds of, of humans. And so here's how the story goes here. When Moses went and he told the people all the Lord's words and laws. They responded with one voice. Everything the Lord has said, we're going to do. And then Moses then wrote down everything the Lord had said. Second mention of the writing of the Bible in the Bible. Now, so once again, there's no mention of a trance here, right? It's Moses had this experience of being in the divine and holy presence of God. Now that's remarkable. I'll give you that. That's a very, very remarkable experience. I've never quite had that experience and I'm not sure I want to, right? Uh, because most of the people in the Bible who do are afraid for their lives. So, but, but what, and that, and what he hears and discerns, the voice of God speaking to him is this new way of life for God's people. And so Moses is then asked, 
from his own recounting experience, right? He's asked to write down everything that the Lord that the Lord had said. It's a divine and human word, but here it's doing something different than the previous story, right? So the first story, the first story it's about writing the story of this event, how God saved his people, but now we're we're writing down right, words and laws. We're writing down again, not it's not just rules and commands. We're writing down the terms of a covenant relationship. Israel is to come under this God's loving, gracious authority, because they know he's loving and gracious because they already rescued them. And this is this is the new way that they say they want to live as an expression of their gratefulness and devotion to this God who rescued them. And so it's, it's the terms of the covenant. So whatever the Bible is, it's not a rule book dropped from heaven. It's telling the story of what God has done to rescue his people. Press the green button and lo and behold, a wonderful, wonderful summary, right? So I, just from these two first mentions, we can learn, we can learn a new story about how the Bible came into existence and why it came into existence. It's a divine and human word, and it tells the story, and then it, it contains the terms of the covenant relationship that God wants his people to live by. Not just because God's uptight, you know, and it's because God wants to make new and different kinds of humans out of us. And that's, and that's what all of these laws represent. Uh, they're good, they're a blessing. Uh, you read later Israelite poetry in the Bible about what these people thought about the laws, and they were thankful. They thanked God, and they praised God for the laws of the covenant because it challenged them to become the best versions of human beings that they had ever known about before. Okay, there you go. H- how you guys doing? So that's the first drink from the, from the fire hose. It's a recap of, of uh, what I did yesterday. But right here, you get the meaning of the Bible. The, the writing of the Bible is just getting started, but the meaning of the Bible, it's all, it's all right there. So here's um, what we're going to do. We're just going to briefly kind of paint the narrative of how each of the two huge collections of the Bible came into existence. Uh, the Hebrew Bible, or Christians call it the Old Testament, and then uh, the New Testament, or the New Covenant documents. Um, the Hebrew Bible continues to be written, and uh, over a process of, a, of about 1,200 years from those stories, when those stories and events took place in history, a process of 1,200 years of the writing of the books of the Hebrew Bible. Um, the final shape of the Hebrew Bible uh, has uh, this, this shape to it. It's called uh, the Tanakh in Jewish tradition. Um, and that, those letters, T-N-K, it's a, a little acronym. Uh, and in Ju- the Jewish traditional ordering of the Bible, it's very, very ancient, and we'll, and we'll talk about why that's important. Um, it's three sections, each of which begins with the letter you see there on the, on the left that's underlined. So Torah, it's a Hebrew word that means teaching or instruction. And that uh, refers to the first five books of the Bible, um, called the books of Moses or the Pentateuch. Um, in Jewish tradition, the next section of the Hebrew Bible after that is called the Nevi'im. And that's the Hebrew word for prophets. And that has two sections. You see the yellow and the orange right there. Um, in the yellow, it continues the narrative of right from the book of Deuteronomy. You can finish the Torah and turn to the book of Joshua and it, you haven't skipped a beat. It just continues right on going. And you've got four books that are telling the story of Israel going into the promised land of failing to live up to the terms of the covenant and the ruin and the destruction that happens, Samuel, the kings that come along and sometimes they're good, mostly they're bad, and the whole thing does a crash landing in the book of Kings. And uh, they have a civil war and they split into two kingdoms. Uh, The northern kingdom uh, is erased from the map of history by the Assyrians in 722 BC. And the southern kingdom, Judah in Jerusalem, uh, is destroyed and conquered and uh, taken into exile to Babylon in 587 BC. That's the story that those books in yellow take place. The books in the orange, they're called the latter prophets, these are the poetic and narrative writings and collections of these very eccentric figures in the story that you just read in yellow. It's like we're time warping back into the story. It's very interesting. So the white and the yellow is one long sequential storyline. And then the orange books come on 
and fill back in the stories of these very important figures who appeared at different moments in that big sequential storyline. And what these figures are uh, is they, I call them watchdogs for the covenant. They were humans speaking on God's behalf, calling Israel to be faithful to the terms of the covenant, and they never were. And they predicted that doom and destruction and ruin would await them if they didn't be faithful to the covenant, they didn't listen, ruin finally came. The last section uh, is called the Ketuvim, uh, which is the Hebrew word for writings. And uh, I think of this section as like um, that uh, kitchen drawer that you have that has batteries and twist ties, you know, <laughs> and some Ziploc bags and a map and, you know, and the matches and that kind of thing. So, but it's, uh, it has roughly three sections to it. Uh, it begins with the book of Psalms, which is a collection of Hebrew poetry um, almost half of the poems in there are connected to King David and somehow, and somehow, but the rest of them come from a variety of uh, Hebrew authors throughout the story. Uh, Job, Proverbs, these are wisdom writings. You have uh, what's called the five me- books of the Megilot. Uh, they all have the f- those five books, Ruth, Song of Songs, Ecclesiastes, Lamentations, Esther. In Hebrew, the title for each of those books is uh, a feminine noun in Hebrew. It's very interesting, and uh, feminine characters dominate um, those books in different ways that are really interesting. And then the last three books, uh, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, Chronicles, bring the story of Israel up to the point of their return from exile. Okay, there you go. That's a quick overview of the traditional shape of the Hebrew Bible. Um, And each of these sections came into existence in really interesting and unique ways. So here's what I want to do. I just want to touch down each of these sections and look at some of the biblical passages that tell us about the human and divine origins of how these books were written. And my case is just simply this, to tell us that if the narrative of there's the Bible is a result of like a bunch of old political theologians who want to dupe the masses, you know, and create this collection of books that is a political ideological power play over everybody else then the Bible is a very, very strange document, if that's how it came into existence. Uh, Because the Bible has loads of very public information about how it came into existence, and it is definitely not, definitely not that. So, for example, uh, the white section, the Torah, um, we're told multiple times, we looked at two examples. How did the Torah come into existence? Well, who do we at least know played a role at the beginning of its formation? Moses, right? And so, um, but here's what's interesting is that if you are reading in different parts of the Torah, you'll come across different things. Oh, like it's a good one in the book of Genesis, right? Which is recounting events from before Moses even came into existence. And you'll, you'll get to a genealogy, which is great bedtime reading, you know, if you're, uh, if you're feeling sleepy in, in Genesis 36. And the genealogy begins, yeah, this is the genealogy of the generations of Esau, Jacob's brother. Now, this genealogy records uh, the generations of Esau from before when there were any kings in Israel. And you're like, wait a minute. Like, the kings in Israel didn't come, like, for centuries after Moses came into existence. Do you see this here? So, the, the Pentateuch itself points to the fact that it came into existence in different stages. It had its own formation history. Moses is at the fountainhead, and there's a succession of authors after him. And these authors drew on lots of different historical sources as they compiled uh, this epic narrative of the Torah and, and the prophets. And they don't even hide the fact that they're, telling, that they're drawing this from different sources. They tell you it quite a few times, actually, right there. So you'll be reading a story in Numbers, and the Israelites are going through the wilderness, and they're going into this region. They find a well there. And then there's a little poem that says, you know, they found this well there. Oh, yeah, sorry, I got all this from the scroll of the wars of the Lord, right? You're reading a story in Joshua about this battle. They went in here. Oh, yeah, dear reader, I got all this from the scroll of Yashar and so on. This has happened dozens of times as you're reading through the story. So the, the, the book itself gives full evidence 
of how it came into existence and that it came into existence in stages. You know, think of like a, like a book that would be like a, a history of a people group and there's 10 different historians working on it, each on different sections. It goes through multiple editions, revised and updated, you know. That's, there you go. The Bible's telling us that's how uh, these first books came into existence. Now, what are these sources? And what, what should we envision the biblical authors doing? Okay, two nerdy facts. I haven't shown you any ancient tablets yet, so let's solve that right now. <laughs> so so um, this, is, uh, this is fascinating. Okay, the most exciting uh, discovery of uh, ancient biblical texts in the last 100 years is what great event? Dead Sea Scrolls. The greatest, most exciting finds of ancient texts related to the Bible of the hundred years before that. Yeah, yeah, I haven't heard, haven't heard about these before, have you? Yeah, uh, this, uh, this rocked, rocked the world of uh, the late 1800s and early 1900s. So uh, the ancient city of Ugarit, it's a coastal town uh, along, it's modern, modern Syria has a whole section of its coast on the Mediterranean above Lebanon. And Ugarit was a flourishing uh, Canaanite city metropolis uh, from precisely the years that Israel was coming out of Egypt and settling up in the land. These were Israel's neighbors to the far north. And so uh, in the early 1900s, uh, a number of French scholars uh, had a lead that, this, you know, that there were some ruins here. They began a large-scale excavation. They found a city, a whole city. They found a temple dedicated to a god known from the Bible. His name's uh, Baal or Baal. That's how we butcher it in English. <laughs> but uh, Baal is how, how you pronounce the name. And, um, and also a, a god named Dagon, who's also referred to in the Bible. And then in the temple, they found a library. Huge boxes, you know, like, you know, imagine an old box, you know, stone box. And they took off the lid, and it's filled with hundreds and hundreds of these. And the script was known from other um, called uh, Akkadian and Sumerian uh, language and, and script and so on. But the language was like, we don't know what this is. It was a Rosetta Stone, if you're familiar with that story, kind of moment. And so what they, you know, so all of the scholars go to work and spend their whole careers trying to figure out what this is. And they discover, oh my gosh, like this is a, this is a Semitic language. This is a cousin language to ancient Hebrew. And it is, it's, it reads virtually like ancient Hebrew, but in a totally different alphabet. So when you, when you hear about the people groups that were in the land of Canaan, here's one of them. We discovered their city and their whole library. And this is so fascinating that, okay, I could go on much longer, but I'm not going to, right? But it's really, really interesting. But so the, here's an example. This was uh, the production of texts in the ancient world. In Egypt, they've got lots of um, papyrus, and so they're making it down there on, on scrolls and so on. But up in the land where Israel is, clay tablets, and they're small, they're like this big. And this is how they are, this is their, write, their writing system. And it's all, it's historiography, it's uh, priestly texts. There's texts in here that read just like the book of Leviticus. It's really interesting, like priestly tech manuals for how to butcher animals and, you know, that kind of thing. It's really interesting, I think. So anyhow, so, it's all, so, so imagine, like this is how people in those times would write texts. So when you envision a Moses or these other anonymous disciples of Moses and prophetic scribes who were working and compiling the history of Israel, they've got a table of these. They've also got memorized all of these different fixed forms of oral tradition that had been passed on to them because they didn't care about Twitter or Facebook and they didn't melt their brains with TV. They actually used their brains and memorized huge, huge amounts of, of information. You have no idea what your brain is capable of. Um, and it's capable of quite, quite a lot. So here's, here's um, so that's one of the great uh, textual finds from the hundred years before the Dead Sea Scrolls. The other one um, uh, is connected to this picture and this story right here. Um, in uh, the late 1800s, there was a synagogue in Cairo, Egypt, and uh, it, uh, the community wanted to expand the synagogue, and so they had a, a wall at the, at the front, um, which is where uh, the Torah scroll and uh, a large wood thing that holds it is usually kept, and then there's a wall. So they wanted to blow out the wall, and they did, and what they found out, it was a false wall. 
And between that wall that they could all see from the inside and the wall that they could see from the outside was a space about like this, along the whole length of it, full of ancient scrolls. <laughs> it was just like dream come true. So, the <laughs> so they, um, this man right here, uh, his name's Solomon Schechter. He was the professor of Jewish and biblical studies at Cambridge, uh, was called, you know, he got on a, a, a ship and he crossed the Mediterranean. He goes down to Cairo, Egypt, and he crawls into there and he uh, oversees the organization and selection and publication of all of these texts. They're called the Cairo Geniza texts. And there's, it's not just biblical texts that were found in here, but although there were a lot of scrolls of the Bible in there as well. So um, his job, his whole career after that event was organizing and publishing these texts. And so here he is. This is, this is such an epic photo here, right? Because this is all like he's sorted it all out. And now it's like, which one goes with which one? You know, like, is there a piece of an ancient divorce certificate? There were lots of those in there. And so like that one, it's like a ripped off piece that should be go with that one over here. It's like the gigantic jigsaw puzzle with no cover on it. You know what I'm saying? So I don't know, look, I don't know how he feels about his job right now. But there you go. That was his job. This is, um, this I think is how we ought to imagine uh, the authors of the Hebrew Bible. They have received the, all of these collections of, of texts and materials from sources that they quote and tell us about. And the formation of these books, is, it's a collection of a collection of collections. And so we should envision, you know, like a Moses or an Isaiah, or as we're going to see a minute, a guy, a scribe like Baruch, you know, prayerfully sifting over these, you know, like a scrap here that has a beautiful poem and here that tells the story of Judah and Tamar that some of you read recently. That's a whopper, right? That one. And so like all these different stories in there and then they're collating them and then they're putting, they're writing it onto new scrolls and tablets. Are you guys with me here? The, so the Bible, in, in a sense, to say the Bible was written doesn't really help us because we think of writing like this or, or like this. That's why I, I titled this talk, The Making of the Bible. The, uh, the, the Bible is something that was, it's tactile and was physically produced. And the biblical authors aren't trying to hide that fact from us. In fact, they highlight it for us. Another example um, from uh, the orange books, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the prophetic books. And again, they tell us quite explicitly in the books themselves how they came into existence. So you have uh, uh, these prophetic figures who are called, and they're out there preaching on the street corner and so on. And, uh, you know, they see the poor being neglected, you know, in the city of Jerusalem, and they see, like, crooked uh, uh, pe people uh, doing crooked business practices and, like, un, un, uh, off-weighted scales so people get cheated out of buying their grain or, or whatever. And then they see, like, the wealthy, you know, rulers in Jerusalem, and they're having all these drinking parties every night, and people are getting robbed in the streets, and they're doing nothing about it. And so in Amos or a Jeremiah, or a Micah, they are ticked, right? <laughs> because they're like, no, the whole point of the covenant laws was that this doesn't happen. This is how everybody lives on planet Earth. The whole point is that this is a people that's different. And so these prophets would preach, they would write poetry, they would write essays, they would write songs. And then at certain points, they, as we're going to see here, collected all of these materials and weaved them into the books that are before us in the prophets. So, book of Jeremiah, this is excellent. Jeremiah, we're told in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. So he's a human, but he, he, he senses that God is directing him to do something, to say or do something in a unique way. And that is a that is a true reality of these figures in the Bible. I'm not trying to minimize that fact at all. We're, this is the divine hand here. These are humans sensing an awareness of God's word and reality to direct them to say and to do different things. And that's a part of how the Bible says it came into existence. And this is the human part. Take a scroll and write on it all the words I've spoken to you concerning Israel, Judah, all the other nations from the time I began speaking to you in the reign of Josiah till now. Now, Bible nerds, uh, you know, if you read the book of Jeremiah, you know that that date period, so in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, where the book of Jeremiah started, it says in the first sentence of the book, and the reign of Josiah, 25 years. 
25 years of preaching and writing and, and speaking and writing essays. So imagine, you know, imagine a, a, a pastor or, you know, a public speaker, 25 years worth of material, right? He's being asked to summarize and condense. And co- Are you with me here? Co- so? Right there, <laughs> there he goes. That's, you know, that's a lot of work. That is an enormous amount of work. And there's Jeremiah sitting at his table, you know, oh my goodness. But then, it's, this is really interesting. He actually doesn't do it himself. Because writing and producing these texts, it's a lot of technical skill. And so what does he do? So, so Jeremiah called Baruch, son of Neriah. And you learn about Baruch in the book of Jeremiah. He's a professional scribe. He makes texts for a living. And while Jeremiah dictated the words that the Lord had spoken to him, Baruch wrote them down on a scroll. Now, this is a great story, and this is what happens. So it all gets summarized on this scroll, and then um, Jeremiah is scared to go read the words aloud in the street or in the temple because they're all very critical against the most powerful people in the city. And so he he has Baruch go do it. (laughs) And then Baruch uh, delivers it, and then people here starts saying it, and the friends of the king hear it, and they're like, oh my gosh, stop talking out loud. And so they take it, and they go read it to the king. And it's this great scene of the king sits on his throne, and he hears the scroll being read to him, and he gets so angry, a, a column of text gets read, and he cuts it off with a knife and throws it in the fire. Another column read, that's what he thinks about the word of the Lord through Jeremiah. And so, Jeremiah took another scroll, (laughs) and he gave it to the scribe, Baruch, son of Neriah, which is Jeremiah dictated. Baruch wrote on it all the words of the scroll that Jehoiakim, king of Judah, burned in the fire, and many similar words were added to them. What does that mean? (laughs) It's very, so this is, what edition of Jeremiah is this? This is edition two. And edition two has more than edition one had. How much more? What similar word? Are they Jeremiah's words? Another prophet's words? That, just, <laughs> it's maddening, maddeningly ambiguous. Are you with me here? But there you go. The Bible is not trying to hide how it came into existence. It's very public and sometimes very vague, right? Like this could, this could mean lots of different things. And uh, okay, so one sentence on this, though I did part of this in my dissertation, and I think it's so super interesting. The composition of the history, composition history of Jeremiah is one of the most fascinating test cases because the book of Jeremiah, these two editions left two different traces in history. And you can actually find Hebrew texts in the Dead Sea Scrolls that attest to edition one and to a shorter edition two. It's very interesting. There you go. So talk to me about that more afterwards if you're a nerd. (laughs) So so here we go, the the prophetic books. Uh, Just a sample. Oh, yes. Okay, how can I forget this one? Here we go. Sorry. I have notes here in front of me. I don't know why I'm not not using them right now. Okay. Too excited. So... Um, So, more ancient things that have been dug up out of the ground. So, um, in the city of Jerusalem, you know, just imagine a city like Jerusalem with uh, literally over 3,000 years of habitant inhabitants and uh, people and excavations. So, archaeology in Jerusalem is the most exciting thing going on, right? Every year they turn stuff up. Um, In the early 2000s, they were sifting through a section of old Jerusalem, you know, they're sifting through, you know, dirt, and up pops this little tiny fossilized rocky thing, and uh, actually they find a a lot of these, it's an ancient seal. So think like a scroll, right, in Baruch, we know they're in the business of writing scrolls, and then, but think of like a medieval movie or something, a movie about medieval times when you have a scroll and you seal it with wax and then what do you do to tell you, you know, who it comes from? The seal, the stamp, so on a ring or on a necklace or something, and it has a name or an insignia on it. So they find these all the time of uh, attesting to names uh, of people living in ancient Jerusalem. And so they found this one in the, <laughs> about over 10 years ago. Belonging to Baruch, the son of Neriah, the scribe. <laughs> okay, so that's, that's really incredible, I think. And here, so, and uh, apparently this, this was a, a necklace one so, that would have been used to like press down into the wax because can you see the ridges, the thumb ridges of a finger? This thing's small, very small. Can you see the thumbprint ridges right there? There you go. 
Isn't that great? <laughs> it's the fingerprint of a biblical author. And it's the only thing like it. You know, this is very unique and special. Um, other seals have been found referring to biblical characters and the kings of Israel, but this one, you know, that makes your, makes your ears tingle, uh, which is a phrase from the book of Jeremiah. Go look it up. Okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> uh, a sample from the last section of, of the Hebrew Bible, um, and this one's, this one's really fun because the implications, I think, are significant. Uh, this one's from one of the wisdom writings, the book of Proverbs, and that's this. It's that the, the, these books of the Bible very often have the prominent figures that the books associated with, how their name on the front, that doesn't necessarily mean that they wrote and produced the book. Jeremiah is an example. Proverbs is another interesting example. So the book of Proverbs begins, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, the king of Israel. It's the first line of the book. So in modern terms, we, we consider that to be the, on the cover of a book. Oh, that is the person responsible for this book. But even in our culture, we know there's often more to the story, you know, right? <laughs> than just that person actually like, you know, hacked it all out on, on their laptop or whatever. So, because you get into the book of Proverbs itself and you come across, there's a break and then a new poem begins and it says, yeah, these are the sayings of the wise ones. Well, who's that? And then you get to chapter 25. Oh yeah, here's some more Proverbs of Solomon. But these were the ones compiled by the men of Hezekiah, the king of Judah. And if you're a Bible nerd, you know that Solomon and Hezekiah are separated by two centuries. So this is another s collection of Proverbs that were in the royal archive, they were in the temple archive somewhere, and someone's like, oh man, these should be a part of this book too. And then you get to chapter 30, and it's a, it's a whole collection of little poems, the fascinating little uh, riddles the, in chapter 30 of the sayings of Agur, the son of Yaqeh. Who's that? <laughs> Nobody knows. <laughs> it's the only time in ancient history that this guy's mentioned, and that goes uh, also for the King Lemuel. And chapter 31 is a collection of the sayings of King Lemuel that his mom taught him. <laughs> All right? And some of you might be like, that's actually, that, I'm going to trust that chapter more than any other one, you know? Because <laughs> um, Solomon was a, sh a shady character. <laughs> so there you go, the book of Proverbs. So the book of Proverbs, and this is tied to the theology and the message of the book of Proverbs, is that wisdom, anytime you see a human being acting with justice and generosity and wisdom, you're seeing the image of God at work. And wisdom... That's a, that's a part of human nature. That's a part of God's glorious goodness that we are made to be and that we reflect to each other. And so, man, wisdom taken from Agur, Lemuel's mom, or Solomon, <laughs> it all comes from the same source. Are you with me here? And that, that idea is the main point of Proverbs chapter 8, where wisdom speaks out and says, wherever kings are reigning justly, they're using me. And it's very, very powerful. So anyway, the book of Proverbs is trying to, it's a very public about that it came into being and has the wisdom of lots of different people. Okay, that's our crash course. We looked at one example from each section of the Hebrew Bible. And it's just, I mean, I think it's really awesome. Right? Um, but this isn't a golden tablet falling from heaven. This is a book that has a traceable history of human origins and that claims about itself that it's a human and divine word that tells the story of this people, that demands the people who have been saved and rescued live under God's goodness as a new and different kind of people. It actually tells the story of their failure, and it tells the story of what God wants to do uh, with these people and, and with, with his world. Now, here's what's really interesting. And... Um, Okay, here we go. All right, I just looked at the clock for the first time. So, all right, the, uh, here's what's really interesting, and I, I can't do more, but just note writers, write it down. This is, this is really, really, really fascinating. These three sections of the Tanakh, the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim, if you look at, at what scholars call the literary seams of these three collections, if you li literally look at the last paragraph of the Torah, you'll find that it concludes with a little line that says, now, dear reader, Moses was really a remarkable prophet. He led God's people. He rescued them from Egypt. And you know, no prophet like Moses has ever, ever come again. So very clearly that's written by somebody other than Moses, right? And, 
And it's, it's saying that somehow Moses was amazing. Man, wouldn't it be great to have a prophet come who was remarkable and who could save God's people again? And if you then turn to the last sentences of the last book of the prophets, you read a, a line that reads for all intents and purposes like a little editorial edition to the end of the book of Malachi that says, hey, dear reader, remember the Torah from Moses and look forward to the great prophet like Elijah who's going to come again one day and restore God's people to him. And then you read the first lines of the book of Joshua and God, and God tells Joshua, hey, this, the scriptures that you've inherited from Moses, you need to meditate on them day and night and not turn from the right or to the left and you'll have success in all you do if you're guided by the scriptures. And then you go to the first book of the writings, which is Psalm 1, and Psalm 1 opens, many of you read it, you know, in the last few weeks, and it says, dear reader, you know what you should be like? The person who meditates on the scriptures day and night and doesn't turn to the right or to the left and you'll find success in all that you do. Anybody? This is called editing. <laughs> this is called somebody with a, a literary sophistication and brilliance who's woven the entire collection of collections together into one book with two messages, two main ideas. First of all, we need a powerful word of God in a new way that's going to restore the hearts of God's covenant people because we're sitting here in exile and we don't know what's going to happen. And in the meantime, as we're waiting for the prophet and the Messiah, we need to bury ourselves in these scriptures and allow the story and allow the terms of the covenant to shape us into new and different kinds of people. Anybody? Okay, so that's our crash course through uh, the Hebrew Bible. So what's significant, what is significant about this is that this, this thing drops into history. It has a long history of formation. The final books of the Hebrew uh, Bible, oops, sorry, back, back, here we go. In terms of the dates in which they're written, and you can tell from looking at inside of them, uh, are uh, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, Chronicles, and a couple of the prophets, and Esther. And we can tell that this collection got edited into the single book somewhere in the 300s BC. So we're bat somewhere in the ballpark of two to three hundred before Jesus. Just a couple centuries is when the final editorial weaving of the Tanakh came together. And, and then here's what the literary production and the writing of manuscripts in Jewish culture didn't stop. There are lots and lots of other texts that kept on being produced. But there's something about this collection as a coherent, unified statement that was unique. It's like a boulder got thrown into Jewish history when this thing got unified and edited together. Because all of a sudden, you start reading the literature from this later period, the Dead Sea Scrolls are included in it, and they're just referring to all of these writings right here as a divine and human word. But what's fascinating is that everybody's quoting from these books. And um, I just want you to hear the words of, uh, of a Hebrew Bible scholar. He's written the definitive historical treatment of the formation of the Hebrew Bible. Um, he's a part of the Christian tradition. He wouldn't self-identify as like, I'm a follower of Jesus. So just hear me. He's like, he would, he's a secular critical historian, right? Who's, you know, grew up in church, basically. And so, um, and this is, this is his description. And you know, I'm not putting these words in his mouth, and uh, I think this is super fascinating. He says, it is very striking that over a period ranging from the second century BC, so the history, Jewish sources and literature, right after the period of the Hebrew Bible getting unified, right through to the first century CE, so the century in which Jesus lives, lots of Jewish history and events going on there. So many writers of so many divergent groups, and he named some, Palestinian, those living in Jerusalem and Judah, Hellenistic, Jewish communities living down in Egypt and Alexandria, Pharisaic, Jews living in the land of Judah that are super, super rigid, <laughs> All right? And they have a very like discerned, uh, well-defined theology. The Essenes, and by here he's referring to uh, the Jewish community that produced the Dead Sea Scrolls. And this is a group, a, a sectarian group. They got essentially ousted of power 
ousted out of power in Jerusalem, they think everybody's going to hell in a handbasket and that they're the only true Jewish people. And so they withdrew to the desert and they took their library with them. And we're very thankful that they did that. So that's the Essenes. And then, uh, and then the early Christians, which for the first two generations was a Jewish messianic movement. So what he's saying is, from 300 years of all of this diverse, very diverse Jewish cultures, here's what's happening. They all show such agreement about the canon of the Hebrew Bible. None of these witnesses are concerned with asserting the authority of the books they mention. Rather, they all assume Scripture's authority, and they go on to debate about their interpretation. So the Qumran community that produced the Dead Sea Scrolls, they think that their community is the fulfillment of the Torah and the prophets and the whole story. In a figure that led the community, they call him the teacher of righteousness. And of course, the, uh, the, the sect of the Nazarenes, right, the earliest followers of Jesus, they believe that the story of the scriptures is fulfilled in Jesus of Nazareth. And the Pharisees believe that the story of the scriptures will be fulfilled if the people of Israel will just live according to their theology. Right? So you have all of these groups that all disagree. What, they're all, what they don't disagree on is what is the Bible? They quote from it. They debate about it, and these debates uh, assume, assume that authority. So here's his conclusion. He says, it's very clear that these groups don't speak simply for themselves. They represent Judaism as a whole, because they all hate each other, right? <laughs> right? They have very broad representation of Judaism. Any inference that the canon was decided by councils, one group pulling a power play over all the other groups, do you see how ridiculous that conclusion is in light of the evidence? Are you with me? here? Because you have, I'm sure all of these groups would dream and salivate at the opportunity to pull a power play over all of the other groups. But that's precisely what did not happen. The Hebrew Bible isn't that. The role of later councils was not to decide the canon, but rather to confirm decisions about the canon already reached in other ways. There's no evidence in the history of Judaism or the Hebrew Bible about a group of people sitting down and saying, oh, this book's in the Bible, but that one, no, definitely not. Let's take that one out. That's just, that's, it's, that, that never happened. We don't have evidence for that. What we have evidence is for the organic growth of the law, the prophets, and the writings that just by nature of what they were uh, created their own momentum in Jewish history and that they were uh, collected and put together and received and then fought over and debated about <laughs> in Jewish. Are you guys with me here? Yeah. How you doing? Very good. Okay. So that, I, that's a very reasonable, honest conclusion to draw about the nature of the scriptures. And you can disagree with it, but if you're going to disagree with it, you should have other evidence, right, that points in a different direction. And of course, scholars debate about this and I'll give you lot, uh, some recommended reading at the end. But this is a historical, defensible position. It's held by many scholars in the field, um, and it's definitely not the Da Vinci Code story. Are you with me? Okay. Part two. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, no, we're just going to go. We're just going to go. Okay. All right. All right. Really? No, I, I'm really, I'm supposed to, I, okay, okay, real quick, real quick. <laughs> All right, so uh, how do we know that that unified Hebrew Bible, so you've got a, maybe if you've got a Bible sitting in your lap right now, it's the English translation of the Bible, and you know, how, what's, how did you get from that two to three hundreds B.C., collection of the Tanakh to the books that are translated into English in your Bible. And in a very brief nutshell that doesn't do justice to how wonderful and exciting this, this section of biblical studies is, uh, there's three main bodies of textual evidence. There's actually more, but these are the three most significant ones about the text, the wording of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, the first is a set of medieval manuscripts that come from the period you see there. They're called the Masoretic Texts. Um, and so this is a body of text spanning 600 years, which is itself a pretty long period of time. And within this body of text, these guys were such introverts. <laughs> like they just, like I, could, they had no life other than uh, this was a trained professional skill within uh, the tradition of, of people who became rabbis, and they were absolutely brilliant. And so these, these manuscripts come with not only the biblical text, but they come with all kinds of notes and references. The, the resolution of the picture 
isn't that great. But can you see there's three columns there? That's from Jonah chapter 1. And can you see there's some stuff on the top and the bottom? Can you see that there's kind of something on the side? I know it's hard to see in this image right here. In a, in a better resolution, just Google Masoretic text and you'll see a picture for yourself. And this is all, these are all Bible nerd notes right here on the sides and on the bottom. And they are, there's little symbols connected to words in the text. So you're reading along and you see a little symbol. Oh, and it takes you, it's like a little footnote. And it'll say, hey, dear scribe, you know this, see that word? It's spelled kind of funny. Do you know that word occurs three times in the entire Hebrew Bible? Here's the references right here. Don't misspell it right here. Thank you very much. <laughs> and then it goes on. And it's all like super, super detailed about words that are odd. So don't miss, but it's all about, it's all about preserving the, this text. So this was the main uh, format textual witnesses that we had, along with uh, Greek translations that were made, you know, we're talking like some 800 years or more before the Masoretic text. This was produced by a group of uh, Jewish communities down in uh, Alexandria, Egypt. And so that's a very uh, significant uh, witness to the text of the Hebrew Bible. But then the Dead Sea Scrolls show up and now we're talking. Because now we can look at the same book of the Bible from 1200 AD or 600 AD, and then time warp back 600, 800 years and look at the gap and compare these texts. And it's, abs it's so amazing and remarkable, this field of biblical studies. Um, it's where I focused on my, my research for my dissertation with the book of Ezekiel. And the first, the most important takeaway is that the text of the Hebrew Bible over this period, you know, this test sample period of a thousand years, it's remarkable how these texts have been accurately preserved. It's absolutely remarkable. Are there differences between these witnesses? Oh, yes. Oh, totally. Yeah, and that shouldn't bother you one bit. <laughs> it shouldn't bother you one bit. In fact, I think it's, that's the most fascinating and interesting thing about all of this. Most of them are inconsequential. They're scribal errors because, dude, if you had a written text in front of you and you're doing this, you know, six hours a day, you're going to make some, some mistakes. And, and this is your mind melted by TV and Twitter. You know what I'm saying? Like, imagine these are like people who are actually smart and use all of their brains who are trained to do this, right? <laughs> and, so, but even they're going to make mistakes. You know what I'm saying? So, but some of the differences are significant. Some of the differences actually peek us back into edition one, edition two, like the book of Jeremiah. We actually get a window through the Dead Sea Scrolls into that final period of the formation and uh, the crystallization of the text of the Hebrew Bible, and it's so interesting and fascinating. What's great is that we, it's, we don't have, it's not the case that like some part of the Bible was lost. We actually have too much of the Bible. This is like thousands of manuscripts, right? And so we, imagine a boulder thrown into a pond. Ripple effects go everywhere. And so we have text from over here, we have text from right in here, and here, and here, and here, and here. So any difference or error that happens here, well, we can just look over here. Oh, yeah, so that's clearly an error. This is definitely the right one here. And so Bible nerds through the centuries um, have been culminating in this. Here it is right here. Every English translation of the Old Testament that you've seen in the modern world comes from one source, and you're looking at it right here. It's called the Biblia Hebraica Quinta. Uh, it used to be called the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia, but now it's called the Biblia Hebraica Quinta. And so you see this book of Ruth, there it is, Hebrew text of the book of Ruth, and all under there is decades and decades and decades of scholars looking through all of these ancient text witnesses, compiling all of the differences right there, so that we can, with a high, high degree of confidence, know what uh, the text of the Hebrew Bible says. Are there places that are puzzles and mystery and things to be solved? Absolutely. That's why you would become a biblical scholar, because you love that kind of stuff. But can we, with a high degree of confidence, know that the Bibles that we have come from that unified Hebrew Bible from the third century BCE? I think it is, it's not just more than reasonable. You need to have exceedingly good reasons to not think that. How are you doing? I was going to skip that, <laughs> so maybe I should. You know, okay, all right, here we go. All right, I, th I think we're doing good. Because the New Testament's shorter, so this won't just take our time, right? <laughs> so we get to uh, the New Testament. Fire hose. Fire hose is still spraying right now. So we get to the New Testament, and this is interesting, and it's the fact that I think most Christians don't really know about, is that the Bible that Jesus read was... 
So this is, this is a Bible study that Jesus had. He's, he's risen from the dead. And I don't know, maybe if you're not a Christian, you find that one hard to buy, okay? But th that doesn't matter. What matters is, here's the apostles, and what they rem when they remember Jesus talking about the Bible, here's how they remember him talking about it. This is what I told you, Jesus says, while I was with you. Everything must be fulfilled that was written about me in the Torah of Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms. Now that's interesting, because that's a, you know, he's referring to a section of the Bible, a section of the Bible, and then one book of the Bible. But do you remember where did the book of Psalms come in the Ketuvim? Going back, back, there it is. Oh, conveniently. It's the, and I, what, are you, what name are you going to give that section? It's the junk drawer. You know, it's the default kitchen drawer of the kitchen. You know, it's the twist ties, Ecclesiastes, and the batteries, Song of Songs. Like it. So he calls it by the first, by the first book of that uh, third section of, of the Bible. So uh, to me, it's just, okay, there you go. Jesus uh, grew up and was immersed in the writings of, of the Tanakh. That was his Bible. That's the Bible that he was referring to when he said that I didn't come to set aside the ancient scriptures. I came to fulfill them. When he said, love God and love your neighbor, the Torah and the prophets, everything hangs. It's all, its essence is all, is all right there. So here's, um, the, here's where we go in terms of where the New Testament comes from. And this is going to sound familiar because it's very similar. <laughs> it's a very similar story. You have the risen Jesus who's forming a new covenant people who are being transformed by what, who he is and what he's doing for them. And they're the people that he believes who are going to be able to fulfill the terms of the covenant. Not because they're so great, but because he's here to do it on their behalf. And so he does that in his life and in his death and in his resurrection. His last words to uh, his closest circle of 11 disciples at the end of the Gospel of Matthew read like this. And then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples, you know, invite everybody from all planet earth, right? Everybody into this new covenant family to, to acknowledge who I am and what I've done for them. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So bring them into the covenant family, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. So just stop and think about that. Just remember our first point, first couple points. What, why did the Bible come into existence? To tell the story of what God has done to rescue and redeem a people, and then to invite those people into a covenant relationship and to live by the terms of the covenant. <laughs> right? So what, what is the Gospel of Matthew? It's telling the story of what God has done to save and redeem a people through Jesus of Nazareth. And then it contains all of these teachings of Jesus. And Jesus says, yes, exactly. If you want to follow me and become a part of this family, then you will live by my teachings. And that's exactly what he's commissioning them to do right here. Are you with me here? So what, right here is the origins of the New Testament, right? The, you, the meaning of the New Testament. It's just being formed in terms of the history of events, but the meaning is right there, and it's just a continu continuation of what the meaning of what the Bible already was in the first place. Are you with me? Okay, so here's, um, we just really have two sections to go at in terms of how the New Testament comes into existence. The first main section of the New Testament, it's, the, it's four biographies of Jesus. And lucky for us, uh, the third one in terms of the order of your Bibles, Luke, he has a little note at the beginning to say, hey, dear reader, hi, you know, it's me. I wrote this, and here's why I wrote this. Here's what I want you to, in fact, here's the process that I went through to bring this book into existence, and here's what he says. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. That's a way of referring to Jesus and the story about him as fulfilling the storyline of history and of the scriptures. Just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses, the last S should be yellow, and servants of the word. <laughs> now with this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. That, in Greek, with one sentence. 
Yeah, look in English, he had to cut it up. But in Greek, that is one beautiful literary sentence. Okay, um, so, so what is Luke telling us here? First of all, um, do other accounts of the story of Jesus exist by the time Luke starts doing his work? Yeah, yeah, they do. We know what one of them was because he used it as a source. It's called the Gospel According to Mark. And he says, just where did we get these accounts, the accounts that he's going to pay attention to and that he's going to incorporate a source material into his account of Jesus, where do these come from? So they were handed down to us. And here he uses a, a technical term, paradidomi in Greek. It's, it's, the, it's the, the work of professional keepers and passers-on of, of oral or written tradition, scribes and oral historians. And who are these people who are the keepers? He calls them the servants of the word. Who are these people? What does he call them? The people who were there. Do you see this here? So he's like, okay, the Gospel of Mark, which is rooted uh, in the eyewitness memories of, of Peter, and there's indications within Mark that give us clues of that, and that's actually what was remembered in 100 years after it and said about the Gospel of Mark by the early church scholars. So he uses the eyewitness testimony of Peter, written down by John Mark. That's one of his sources. But then he's like, yeah, I went to work. You know, everybody's still alive. So I went to work like investigating everybody. And I put it all together here for an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Now, who's that? That's the million dollar question, right? Who's, why, you know, to have a biblical book dedicated to you. What does that cost? You know? <laughs> um, and, I, and we're not far from the truth, probably, um, be, because m most likely, uh, this is one theory, I think it's the most probable, there are other theories out there. He, this is a, a common thing that authors would do, dedicate the book to the patron who paid for the research leave so they could do the, so they could do the hard scholarly work of research. Are you with me here? So uh, I, there are other views out there, but I, I think that's the most compelling. And what he wants to do is to Theophilus and to the church at large so that they can have even more certainty about the things that they've already been taught about Jesus. So here's my way of, of drawing this. Note takers, you'll, you'll like this. this is, um, so here we go. This is my, my silly way of, of thinking about how the Gospels came into existence. The picture right there, this is interesting. Um, about five years ago, there was a, a, a group of British archaeologists uh, and they worked in the f field of Jewish archaeology and so on in the, in the Holy Land. And what they, they did, these 3D scans of every Jewish male skull found from tombs and so on that, that dates to the time period. And they created a general portrait of the average Jewish man living in the time of Jesus. <laughs> and there it is. That's it. You can Google it. It's really interesting. So I don't, I don't know. It, is it Jesus? No. Could it be what Jesus looked like? Absolutely. I mean, I, that's actually the best crack we have at it, you know, not the stained glass windows so, or European movie stars or whatever. So there, so there you go. So that's Jesus. So here's Jesus, right? The years and the, the years that he lived, he's there speaking, teaching, doing healing, talking, all that. And then you have the, the four accounts, each of which is linked, as we'll explore in a couple minutes, to one of those apostles who is a part of that circle that Jesus deputized and commissioned to spread the story and his teachings to all of the nations. So, but we've got a gap of a few decades in between those two. Are you with me? So that gap in popular imagination gets filled with what you used to do at your junior high sleepovers, right? With your friends, which is like you would say some telephone game. You guys with me? So you would whisper, you know, whatever, 10 little elves, go to the market and get some milk or something like that. I, don't know, I, just, I just made that up. So you, so you whisper that into a friend's ear. And then your friend like whispers that, you guys know the game? You know what I'm talking about here. And then it's like comes back and it's like 10 elephants, go buy a popcorn or something like that. So, and are you guys with me? And many think like, oh yeah, they were just telling campfire stories of Jesus and they were doing this. That's the, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. First of all, their brains weren't melted by Twitter and TV, right? And second of all, we know like these, the events of Jesus, whatever, whatever happened with Jesus, these were clearly 
absolutely life-shattering, transforming experiences that people had with this man. And you're telling me that they're going to tell and retell and retell among circles of people who, they were all there, they all saw and heard what happened, and in the span of the lifetime of the eyewitnesses, those are going to get so overcooked that there's no legitimate, authentic, historical trace of what Jesus said or did in, in these four Gospels. This is, you, ha you have to be unreasonably skeptical to come to that conclusion. In, in my opinion, there are really smart people who disagree with me, but I disagree with them. And I, you know, I don't know what to say about that. I just, uh, you know, let's not, let's not be silly. Anyway, so here's, here's um, a very si a simple way of, of depicting uh, how these uh, books came, came into existence. Um, and to think of them like, like quilts. That's a picture of a, a quilt uh, that my wife uh, has. Uh, it was a gift to her from her gr a grandmother a number of years ago. And it's, you know, it's in the plastic bag. That's why it's all still nice and clean and so on. But her grandma made this decades ago. The pieces of this quilt come from her grandma's whole lifetime. Some of these pieces of this quilt were given to her by her mom. Some of the pieces of this quilt were things that she acquired throughout the decades and so on. And so my wife, obviously, is a very special quilt and so on. And so there you go. It hangs, it hangs uh, on the wall in her bedroom. Now, you look at the quilt and just take two seconds of thought. Even people like us, whose brains are melted, right, by Twitter and TV, is the age of the quilt the same as the age of the pieces that went into the making of the quilt? No. Are you with me? Do you get it? Yep. Yeah. Do I need to say any more <laughs> about the making of the Gospels? So that's exactly what, you guys, third, this 30-ish year gap, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not a big deal. <laughs> like it's not, these are, this is the light within, oh, how, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, yeah, I'm not sure what happened there. The, <laughs> but you guys see how the spelling got funny? Anyway, so... <clears throat> So the, the events of Jesus by these apostolic eyewitnesses, they're remembered, they're told and retold and retold. Uh, it's like this, like my wife and I, we've married 15 years, and we now have a fixed form. When someone asks us, oh, how did you guys meet? You know, how many times have we told that story in 15 years? We've told it dozens of times. So when we, it's kind of like we each know our parts too. Well, I was in the library, we met in a library. Oh, you guys, we met in a library. <laughs> <laughs> no, our, our first conversation was about whether she should sign up for ancient Greek classes. I'm not joking you. That's, there you go. So, whew, there you go. So we've told that story so many times. You know what I mean? It's taken on a fixed form. We've abbreviated it, right? We've, there have been all kinds of things we've done to condense it and to shape it so that we can tell it in a few minutes and not bore the people who ask us or whatever. But we, so over 15 years now, over half the time period of the gap that we're talking about, my wife and I have done this. It, are the odds are that I'm just going to be like, well, remember, I was riding a stallion, you know? And, I was, <laughs> and she'll just be like, you're an idiot, you know? Like, what? Do you guys get what I'm talking about here? We're ta we have the, the people who were there for the events who have been telling and retelling and retelling the events of the most important events of their lives. And, and the, it's they become their job to do this because they travel around and they do it for a living because they want everybody to know how amazing Jesus of Nazareth was. And so these stories that get written down, these eyewitness accounts that have a fixed oral form, a, a gospel author like Luke does his research, he goes and investigates people, and then just like Moses or Jeremiah sitting at the table with all the scraps, he prays, he goes to work that day, and he arranges the story of Jesus into the Gospel of Luke, as you and I, it's a divine and human word about the story, should I do it again, about the story of what God is in the terms of the covenant and so on. How you guys doing? Okay, let's keep going. Um, the apostolic letters. So at the end of Matthew, Jesus commissioned, right, that circle of apostles, and he, what did he commission them to do? To go out, invite everybody into the covenant family, tell the story, and then to t uh, convey my teachings, what it means to live according to the terms of the covenant as a follower of Jesus. That's, and so uh, right after the four accounts of Jesus are the apostolic letters of, of the New Testament. There's a collection of letters by Paul, and then there's a collection of letters by the other key figures, Peter, John, 
and so on. You guys with me? Here, it's the letters of the New Testament. Now, Paul was uh, one of the first additions onto the team. Judas dropped out, right? So you went from 12 to 11. <laughs> and then Paul, not, not without a period of discernment, was added to that circle because he had made it his life goal to kill as many followers of Jesus as he could, right? And then all of a sudden he met the risen Jesus and it scared him to death, right? And it, all of a sudden he's, he becomes a part of this circle. So they're writing letters. What are these letters about? These letters are, uh, uh, they bear witness to the growing family of followers of Jesus. And so they're writing to Jesus' followers in Rome, all these places. They're doing exactly what Jesus told them to do, right? The movement is spreading into all the nations. And so Paul and what these apostles are doing, they, they're not just repeating the stories and the teachings of Jesus, the gospels, you know, are, and those stories are already out there. What they do is they give greater discernment and greater guidance. So you have Christians in Rome and the church is split between Jewish Christians and non-Jewish Christians. And there's all these like cultural conflicts happening between them. And so what does Paul do? He takes Jesus' great command, love God, love your neighbor. He takes the great covenant story of Abraham who has become a father and a blessing to all nations. And he applies the teachings of Jesus and the story of the Bible to help this community resolve its conflicts so they can become the light to that city in Rome that Jesus wants them to be. Do you see that there? That's what each of these apostolic letters does. It's addressed to a real community and it applies the story of Jesus and the truth and, and the whole story of the Bible to the problems that this community was facing. And so it's wonderful for us because we actually get all of these test cases of the apostles doing what Jesus asked them to do. Because if you're a follower of Jesus, you're in a Jesus community too. And my hunch is that that's full of other people who are in that community that, you know, they're like your weird uncle. You know, you're supposed to like them, but really you don't. You know? <laughs> and they sing different songs than you and they dress differently than you. And Jesus says that you're supposed to love them more than you love yourself. How are you gonna do that? Lucky for us, we have the writings of the apostles who they're helping the early Christians sort this out. So who wrote these letters? Well, uh, okay, so it's, they're supposed to be written by the apostles themselves, but it's more interesting than that. So the first letter, first epistolic letter in the New Testament, Romans, how does it begin? Who's it written by? Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle to all who are in Rome. And you're reading the whole letter through and you're like, okay, this is Paul's voice. And nobody debates that. There's actually not any skeptical scholar on the planet who thinks that the book of Romans doesn't come from Paul. The last chapter of Romans, chapter 16, it's a greeting list. It's, it's wonderful. You'll get there sometime in September or something like that, right? And uh, it's literally like he's never been to Rome. He wants to get there, but he knows lots of people there. And so it's a whole chapter of be like, oh, say hi to Phoebe. And I, uh, Priscilla is going to come by soon. And like, it's this whole thing of like saying hi to different people. Here's how the last paragraph reads. This is so great. So he says, Timothy, my coworker. Oh yeah, he sends his greetings to you. Oh yeah, so to Lucius, Jason, Sosipater, my fellow Jews. I, Tertius, who wrote this letter. I, hello, hi, it's me too. <laughs> oh yeah, Gaius, whose hospitality I and the whole church here enjoy, send you his greetings. Erastus, he's the city's director of public works. Our brother Cortus. Right? So you've read through this whole letter. You're going, oh, this is, I'm hearing Paul. And you are hearing Paul, but you're hearing Paul mediated through whose technical scribal expertise? Tertius. Isn't this great? Are you with me here? There's no scandal here. There's no, like, it's, he's very, you know, like, did you think he wrote this without Paul's permission? <laughs> no, there's no, like, this is how you write letters, right? If Paul's in prison, he's whatever. He, so we know that some letters, he at least wrote some sections. In Galatians, he says, look, I'm so ticked at the Galatians because they're treating each other so horribly. He's like, I write this conclusion with my own letters, he says at the end of that one. But here he, he let Tertius say hi. So no scandal here. No scandal. Um, for, first, and this one's actually really significant. So the letter of First Peter, same thing. You read the first sentence. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. So those who live in resident aliens all, aliens all throughout Pontus, Galatia, all these different areas in, in Asia Minor. You get to the end of the letter and you read this. By means of Sylvanus, who I regard as a faithful brother, I've written to you briefly. So it's Peter's voice, but he's telling you, listen, you're hearing my words and teaching through this letter, through the scribal work of, of Sylvanus. 
And this, this is really interesting, and this is why this is an important example. Who's Peter? Peter's, he was a fisherman from up in Galilee, from up in the you know, boondocks, up in the sticks. We know he didn't get a, a proper synagogue education because it was held against him throughout his career that he wasn't an educated man. And the, the, the Greek of First Peter is beautiful, flowing, flowing literary Greek. It's like high-style Greek. And so, so how on earth does an uneducated Galilean fisherman produce a high-style work of literary Greek? Through Sylvanus. So what, what First Peter is, we're hearing a faithful representation of the voice of Peter, of the, of the teaching of Peter, who, what did Peter actually say to him? It's a divine and human word, right? Peter was with Jesus. He heard him. He, ha- you know, and he, he knows about these, these, here in First Peter, it's these church communities that are under fire, they're under persecution. And so he starts talking to Silvanus. Here's what I want these people to hear. And Silvanus uh, translates all of that into flowing literary Greek. And it's called the letter of First Peter. It's a divine and human word. How you guys doing? Okay, we're almost, we're almost, almost there to land the plane. So we have the, the apostolic letters, and here's how we know they spread, and this is fascinating. It's a little clue in Paul's letter to the Colossians. He says, when this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and you, for your part, should read my letter that's coming from Laodicea. Now, there's a whole bunch of implications of this. First of all, when do you think this letter would be read aloud to these Christians, you know, in Colossae? In the Sunday gathering, when they'd get together to worship Jesus, to hear that and celebrate the stories and teachings of Jesus, to take the bread and the cup, and to hear the teachings of Jesus through the apostles. And so he says, listen, you know, my letter is read to you. So and if you know about Colossians, he's addressing some specific problems in the church in Colossae but he's written it in a way that other churches will benefit from how he helped the, that church sort through their problems. And then he says, yeah, you know, what you'd really read. I wrote a letter to the Laodiceans too. I think you guys would really be helped by that. You should read it too. And right here in this little line is the, a window into how the New Testament spread. And so you have a Jesus movement spreading organically, spreading, spreading throughout the ancient world around the Mediterranean, out into Asia, down into India and China and so on, out into, into North Africa. And wherever these new Jesus communities get planted, they live and meet weekly by the teachings and the stories of Jesus and the apostles. And so the, the, who has a book? Somebody just hold up a book with a nice spine right there. Somebody just show me a book. A book? There you go. Cheers. All right. There you go. So a, a, cur- a fascinating fact of history, that technology of pages bound like this with a solid backbiting is a Christian invention. In, in the history of, of the technology of writing, that's a Christian innovation. Why would the early Christians have need to pack as many pages as possible into, well, they really care about this thing called the Bible, right? And it's, so the spread, like the Bible actually pushed the technological envelope in the history of the technology of writing. And I, so a guy named Larry Hurtado is the scholar on this. Go read his books. It's really interesting. So, so the, this is the spread. And these things are spreading and spreading. And everywhere you go, who, whose writings do you have? And so on. And so there you go. It's the spread of the New Testament. And when people receive these letters of the apostles, look at how Paul talks about how they envision what they're doing when they write these letters and how, he, how the early Christians feel when they receive a letter from Paul or from Peter. He says, we thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, so Paul goes in and he starts telling stories about Jesus, you accepted it not merely as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is at de- indeed at work in you who believe. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, just like Jesus told us to do, whether I'm here giving a sermon or whether I've written you a letter. Is the Bible a human or a divine document in what it claims about itself? Yes. (laughs) Yes. All right. Do you see? Like, it's the two hands right here. 
And this is, not a, this is not a scandal. This is actually the whole, this is the whole point of what these writings are. Okay, we're really, we're cruising and not, there you go. go read 2 Peter 3. That's what I'll just say about that one right there. So here's, again, uh, Henry Gamble. Uh, you know, he wouldn't say, I'm a follower of Jesus. He grew up in a Christian tradition. He's a critical scholar. He's one of the authoritative sources on the making and the formation of the New Testament. And this is what he has to say. The New Testament was not self-consciously created by the church, either as a response to some external pressures, which we'll consider in a second, or as a means to some end. It arose naturally and spontaneously from the inner life of early Christianity, above all in the context of worship and instruction. Do you get it? Yeah. So, so, so when, for, like leading scholar on the formation of the New Testament... Any secret council of politically motivated theologians, ah, I know what we'll do. We'll get everybody in the world to believe in this guy we made up. You know, you know like just, that's just so not where the evidence leads you. What it leads you is to something that's messy, and that is the Jesus movement. It's the organic spreading of these communities that keep spreading because people hear about Jesus and they encounter his presence in these communities and they're transformed and they're like, I'm all in for this guy. And then all of a sudden they get the writings of the apostles and the, and the Torah and the prophets and it's all clicking together for them. And then, you know, man, I have some friends down the road in that town, they need to know. And so it spreads over there and, oh, we need to copy more writings and they need more. And that's how, that's how the writing of, of the apostles, the Torah, prophets, Jesus and the apostles, it's like the, um, my analogy is that they went viral, quite literally. It's those writings that rose to the top. Everybody wants to read them. All these new churches need them. They get copied and copied and recopied, collected and collected and collected. It's a very complex process. But the idea is very simple, isn't it? Like you get it. It's not, that, it's not that complicated. And none of the evidence points to a secret group doing this in some corner. If it was a secret group doing it in some corner, the evidence of what early Christianity is actually doing would not look like what it is. Are you guys with me on that point? Okay, now I kind of have to uh, skip and that's okay. Oh yeah, but not this quote because it's really good. <laughs> all right. So this is, uh, this is good. J leave it to J.R. Packer, who is a Christian theologian, but he is looking at all this evidence and this is what he says. The church no more gave us the New Testament canon than Sir Isaac Newton gave us the force of gravity. Do you get his point there? So Newton didn't obviously create gravity. He pointed out and he's like, everybody, do you see what this, the apple and so on, this whole thing? So... The whole point is that no one needed to argue for the authority and the power of these documents. They were the documents connected to Jesus and the apostles, and they just happened to the early church. And they are the documents that got copied and recopied and recopied and recopied. They're the, precisely the documents that are connected to the apostles, and they're what, you, what we have in the formation of the New Testament. Did it take time? As the church spread, and you know, you have, you have believers up here in Rome, and you have people down here in Carthage and North Africa. I mean, think about the geographical spread here, right? This is going to take time for all of this to spread out, but, but it's precisely these writings that rose to the top. The writings that did not rise to the top were these, right? And Dan Brown, we have Dan Brown to thank um, for this idea that somehow there were actually all these other versions of the life of Jesus and all of these other writings of the apostles uh, that were floating around and that were originally in the Bible. And then some crew of old politically motivated theologians got together and said, no, we take those out because we don't like that. You guys with me here? That's, this, that's a dominant narrative about the formation of the Bible. And I'll, just two minutes of thought. Why do you think that some writings about Jesus ended up lost, forgotten, and buried in the sands of Egypt for 2,000 years, where others were never lost because they were being constantly read and reread and reread and recopied because precisely those are the writings connected to the actual apostles and what Jesus actually said. Are you with me here? These books were never taken out of the Bible because they were never, they was never even entertained that they would be a part of the apostolic testimony in the first place. Jesus, and I, I, don't know, I don't know what to say about this because you watch the History Channel and it's just like, you know what I'm saying? I don't, where do they get it? I actually don't know where they get this idea. Maybe, it, you know, they want to smoke pot and sleep with their girlfriend and so like, okay, so like, I don't want to live under the authority of the Bible and I conveniently find a historical theory that makes me 
Make that okay and I'll be okay with my conscience. I mean, I'm being quite serious about that. It's very easy to accept a narrative about the Bible that's convenient for the lifestyle that you want to live. And Jesus is, is anything but convenient for your lifestyle. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> he'll, he'll challenge every human to their very core. And it's precisely these writings connected to the apostles that do that and have been doing that to God's people for millennia now. And there's no secret society that did this. It's a public event whose history we can trace. One concluding quote, and then we're good. Uh, Michael Kruger's excellent, excellent book on the history of the formation of the canon. Uh, it's worth, it's, it's, a, it's boring. <laughs> but you'll learn a ton. And here's, um, here's uh, his summary. He says, the canon was never authorized or mandated by any general council of the ancient church. It rather rested on the early and largely informal consensus of the church. And we're talking about the centuries before, like the cat, and there's any centralized power centers in Rome or Constantinople. It's just a broad international multi-ethnic movement where these writings have risen to the top. That's what he means by informal. In short, the church did not close the canon because it never started it to begin with. The canon was inherited from the apostles. To every single point that I've made, there are footnotes, there are books and interesting questions to be written, but do you see the narrative? And it's a reasonable narrative. I've been talking for a long time, and I know that. But I, I think this is important, because somehow this is not the narrative that's put forward in our culture. It's also not the narrative that people who grew up in churches get. And that's actually absurd to me. And we need to change that, don't we? So we started here tonight. And, and there you go. So there you go. I'm done talking. And we have some time for live Q&A. And we're going to do that right now. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, it's, um, it's, a, uh, it's a big room, but uh, I'll do my best to restate your question. And, um, you know, if it's a real technical question, maybe come up and talk to me later. But if it's a question that you think, odds are a whole bunch of other people in the room are thinking this too, um, be brave, be bold, and be strong. Hi. Could you just talk a little bit about the Council of Nicaea and how it fits into this theory of like a council? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a great... Um, uh, I can, with confidence, just say Wikipedia, the Council of Nicaea. Um, the Council of Nicaea was the culminating uh, council of a number of prominent theologians to deal with a theological debate about the nature of Jesus, about his human and divine nature and how they go together. That was the purpose of that council, and it was actually culminating decades and decades of debate there were a number of theologians and really influential guys, Pelagius and Arius, and they had uh, views about Jesus that the majority of Christians and these leaders thought weren't true to the writings of the apostles. And so what they were debating at that council and what they decided was a position on the nature and identity of Jesus. Part of that debate was what biblical writings, what writings of the apostles can be legitimately appealed to as sources for truth about Jesus' identity. Um, and so there were some conversations about certain books that people were appealing to that, you know, not necessarily the Gnostic Gospels, but other writings that some of these leaders were appealed to. So the whole point is that, and go watch the History Channel, the Council of Nicaea, you know, Constantine paid for the closure of the Bible. Basically, that's the idea. So it's, it's ridiculous. It's actually, it's ridiculous. And I, I just read, go read all of the material that we still have about the Council of Nicaea. It was a debate about who Jesus was. And a, a, a tangent of that debate was what writings can we refer to as a source of truth about who Jesus is? And that's where the writings about uh, the Bible came into play in, in that debate. That's a, I'm being a real nutshell here, but I know that's such a prominent claim about the Council of Nicaea um, and it's just, it's not true to what, I, what actually happened there. I'm not an expert on those church councils, but I've, I, I've just read the summaries of people who are, and nobody who's actually informed about the Council of Nicaea thinks that the Bible was made at the Council of Nicaea. To, sure, yeah, good question. 
please. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, hi. Thank you for being so bold. I like you. <laughs> yeah, hi. I'm a subscriber. Thank you so much for what you do. Cheers. Um, YouTube subscriber. Uh, <laughs> from, what I, from what I understand, for about a thousand years, I, my, my uh, fiance's mom had an old Lutheran Bible with other books, the Apocrypha. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yes, for yes. about a thousand years, we had other books. Mm. What I, I haven't been able to find is which was the first Bible Mm -hmm. that, that did not have those books, mm -hmm. and was there a council of churches that said, mm -hmm. let's not print those books anymore? Which was mm -hmm. that first Bible? Yes, thank you. Years? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that question. Yeah, if you grew up in uh, certain uh, Orthodox traditions or Catholic traditions, um, there's a section of, of books called uh, the Apocryphal Books. Um, they're, they're actually second editions, longer editions of Esther and Daniel. Uh, they're separate books called The Wisdom of Ben Sira or Ecclesiasticus. It's a little collection. And these are Jewish writings that came into existence in precisely that period. Uh, after I said the Tanakh was edited into one uh, unified document. And so these writings uh, were pa translated into Greek. They were po very popular, very popular. They were very popular in the early Christian movement. Um, and they are included in manuscripts. So there'll be a manuscript that has, uh, you know, some New Testament writings in it, and then you'll find some of these other writings too. So they were very popular uh, in, in the early church and in Second Temple Judaism. What's interesting is that from the internal evidence of the collection of the three-part Tanakh, Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim, those books were never considered to be part of that unified collection. Um, when Jesus referred to that three-part collection, you can tell because he actually quotes from quite a few books. He, I mean, just count up all the times Jesus quotes from the, New, from, uh, the Hebrew Bible. It's quite a lot. And he refers to books in all three parts of the collection. What he never quotes from as scripture is any of, of those books. And so here, theologically, this is where I stand. And other brothers and sisters in Christ disagree with me. That's okay. But why, why do I even read the Hebrew Bible? I'm not in the habit of reading thousand-page ancient texts, you know? For, <laughs> actually, I ended up to go and do quite a lot of that over time. But... <laughs> But I'm not in the habit of doing it, right? I did it so that I could earn a degree. But so, so why do I marry, think covenantly, why do I marry myself to a book as strange as the Hebrew Bible? Because I'm a follower of Jesus. Are you with me? I read the Bible because I'm a follower of Jesus. And Jesus said these writings, strange and wonderful as they are, bear witness to him. They help me understand the story that he sees himself as a part of. And these other writings called the apocryphal books, they're just, when you immerse yourself in the Hebrew Bible and then you go read these documents, you go, oh, these were people who were themselves immersed in the Hebrew Bible. They're aware of their derivative authority from the Hebrew Bible and they're constantly, they refer and quote from the Hebrew Bible the same way Jesus does in these writings right here. Um, the reason, so these writings were widespread. I, I mean, just, you know what, go to any pastor's library right here. Will you find a Bible? in that pastor's library? I sure hope so. Will you find lots of other books in their library? I sure hope so, right? right? Oh, they think those books are a part of the Bible because they're in the same room together. So that's, that's ridiculous, that's ridiculous is what that idea is. And so the, these books are quoted, they're widespread in Judaism and Christianity. They were never considered to be part of the Tanakh. There's no indication that Jesus or the apostles thought they were a part of, of the Tanakh, which was their Bible. But they were widespread. The, the okay, I'll try and complicate it history and then we'll get to another question. Is, is that those books, as the church spread, those books were regarded as scriptural by some communities. Some theolo theological ideas, doctrines were, were formed on the basis of those books. And when the Protestant Reformation took place, part of it was the traditions of the church have become so distorted we need to go back to the scriptures and let jesus and the scriptures be our authority and so you have luther and the reformers and they're pointing out things like yeah we shouldn't be doing that anymore we shouldn't be doing that anymore and uh the and the pope disagreed and so in 1546 the council of trent the, that collection of books was declared to be a part of the bible 
So it's important to get the story right. So that it's not that they were a part of the Bible and then there was a council to take them out. <laughs> there was a council to make them a part of the Bible because of a religious political debate that was happening in the church. And I, um, so there you go. I mean, and there are brothers and sisters who, I mean, I, I, love the, I love the apocryphal books. I actually think they're really amazing to read. Um, but I, I don't think they were a part of Tanakh because there's no historical reason to suppose that they ever did. In, in a short reason. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Hey there. Gregorio. Yes, sir. Hey, yes. Dad. You know, throughout my walk as a Christian in my life, I've been playing Christ in my faith. I'm constantly getting retorted from people that say, oh, Christ, who knows if he's real? The Bible was written by man. Mm -hmm. Well, he's down in Thompson. So, in your opinion, what will be a quick and brief, concise retort? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, that's a serious question, and I'm, I'm quite serious. Um, I don't think there is one. I think there's a friendship that needs to be made, and I think that that's a, a human being who needs to be loved as you love yourself. And I, I'm, not, I'm not just trying to preach. I'm being really serious. Like, you can't prove to somebody that Jesus is real, you can't prove to somebody that God exists or that the Bible is God's word. But what you can do is rely on the power and presence of Jesus so that as you're in friendships with people, that you can, and in these moments that you look back and you're like, was that me? Did I really do that? Where you become a new and remarkably different kind of human and they're in crisis, and you've got them covered. And you and all your strange Christian friends pay their rent and take them to the hospital and give them food. and You know what I mean? And then they go like, oh, I am interested in a story about Jesus now. You know, you know I'm with you. I don't, if somebody doesn't want to hear about Jesus, and odds are they probably have good reasons because they've had some self-righteous jerk people who say that they're Christians burn them in the past. And so, I, yeah, for, in, in my mind, you... You convince people by actually being like Jesus, and then this story and living, by, living in this strange way becomes attractive to, to people. Um, there's lots of historical obstacles or factual obstacles that we need to get out of the way, and I understand that, but when it comes to responding to someone that I hope to persuade them, I, it, you know, it, we're not just brains in a jar waiting to be convinced of facts. We're humans and we're complex. And the way that we come to believe things has as much to do with our desires and our affections as how we arrange the furniture in our head. So that's, that's my short answer. Last, last question. Yeah, hi. <clears throat> Yeah, you would ask that question. <laughs> yeah, three minutes till. The clock might be my savior right here. Um, no, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Um, yeah, so that, so, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, I haven't been doing that. I'm really, I said that I would, and I'm not, I haven't been. So uh, the question is about um, this concept called the inerrancy of Scripture, um, and how do you think that through in light of the divine and human origins of the Bible, exactly. It's, what a, does that word mean, <laughs> right? Um, unfortunately, that's the, the debate has become about a word that isn't even a normal English word, unfortunately. Um, and it's a word that has all kinds of connections to it that aren't helpfully connected to the question. The question is, can I trust the truthfulness of the Bible? That's the question. When the Bible says Jesus did what he did, you know, when these, oh, sorry, when the Bible, it's a diverse collection of writings. When the apostles write these accounts, they say, did Jesus do and say these things? Can I trust that they did? When, uh, the, when the Torah tells a story about these refugees escaping out of uh, Egypt and coming and encountering God at this mountain, can I trust that those events happened? And, and so to me, it's a very important question. Is this make-believe, <laughs> right? So. The word inerrancy has come into the debate to say the Bible has no errors in it. And I, just to phrase the question that way, it, to me it's just not helpful. So let's 
Can I just answer the question, can I trust the truthfulness of the Bible? Because that's actually the question that we're asking. And so here's how I would say it. I would say, when the biblical authors, by the style of writing that they are employing, are making a claim that an event took place in history, then I think we are being asked to trust that that's the case. When the style of writing that they have used is making a claim, part of the complicated issue is that the style in which the biblical authors write is very different than how modern authors write history. And so you have, you know, have all, especially in the, in the first parts of Genesis, you have s stories that are from ancient, ancient past, and they are written in ways that heavily use conventional imagery from the way their cultures wrote about ancient floods and, and the first people and the gods and so on. Are there events under there that generated these stories? I think so is the way that those authors wrote about those stories use metaphor, imagery, I think so, and I think they give clear indications that that's how they're writing about it. So for me, uh, this is about respecting the way that an ancient author wrote history, which is very different than we do. And once we clarify that, it, I think it really illuminates a, a lot of problems. But the basic issue is, can I trust when the Bible says Jesus said and did these things. I mean, my goodness, you guys, if I'm a follower of Jesus, my whole worldview is built on a claim that Jesus rose from the dead. That's very improbable that such an event would happen in the course of history. Have you ever seen anybody experience that? You know, like, no. So it's not probable that Jesus rose from the dead. But I trust the claim and the testimony of the eyewitnesses who were there and say the truth is stranger than fiction, this world is a more marvelous place than can be contained in my head. And so it's very important to me that the truthfulness of the Bible is, is something that we care about. What I want to make sure we don't do is then make the Bible into a 21st century book you know, and make it talk like we would and read all of our modern ideas about science or whatever into these. No, we need to respect and learn how they wrote poetry, how they wrote about events, and, and read the Bible uh, re respecting them as, as authors. So that's my not so short answer. And we're one minute after I'm supposed to end. Thank you so much. That was great.